welcome to this week's episode of Future of XYZ. With us uh, for this special co-branded social venture network, SVC and ASBC, the American uh, Sustainable Business Council, plus LVG and Co. event, we're talking about the future of sustainable retirement with Timothy Yi. Timothy, thanks so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me, Lisa. Absolutely. And Timothy is a board member of SVC. He is also uh, a, the founder and CEO, or president, I guess we say, of Green Retirement Inc., which was one of the original founding B Corps out of the state of California. You're a graduate of Berkeley, UC California, Berkeley, <laughs> as your shirt shows. Uh, you have a beautiful uh, California sunset in the background, and your focus is, as we're going to be talking about today, is sustainable retirement. Your focus exactly. is on 401k planning for, I think, individuals, small businesses, as well as uh, nonprofits. That's correct. Yeah, very much. Yeah, we're in the corporate nonprofit space, and we do have a small group of individual clients who have come to us for help. It's wonderful. Well, I know that you have to, at least as a fiduciary, uh, yes. you need to give a little <laughs> disclosure. So I'm going to turn that over to you for the moment. Thank you very much, Lisa. Again, I'm Timothy Yi with Green Retirement. I'm a registered principal offering securities and advisory services through Independent Financial Group, LLC, IFG, a registered broker dealer and investment advisor, member FINRA, SIPC, Green Retirement Inc. and IFG are unaffiliated entities. Past performance is no guarantee of future results. Nothing in this conversation should be construed as investment advice. And back to you, Lisa. <laughs> Thank you for that. Well, I think the first question we're going to ask, I mean, what you just read is a standard fiduciary disclosure. It has nothing to do with sustainability or any of the other things we're going to be talking about. But the mm. intersectionality and the way that the ind financial industry is starting to revolve is what we're talking about. I, I right. think I was really struck. I mean, every, most people listening know that, you know, I really lean on values um, and, and working in sustainability and social impact is largely the work I do. But I was mm -hmm. really struck when we were talking before that you attended this 401k conference the other day and you said like, you know, what was just a small breakout room on, you know, sustainable investing just a couple of years ago was a plenary session now. Can you talk about the trends that you're seeing happening in what I'll call conscious investing? Yeah, and there are many different definitions of what the investing is, but here's the fact I would share with your, your listeners. $51 billion poured in to ESG funds. Now, ESG is defined in many ways, but focus on that. $51 billion in 2020, that is more than double what came in in 2019, and nearly 10 times what came in in 2018. Hmm. So $51 billion in new flows going into ESG investments, nearly 10 times what it was in 2018. The industry, which is a reflection of the investors, are definitely picking up on that. And certainly my own industry, the 401k, is waking up on that one. Well, that's so interesting because, of course, in order for the 401k industry to wake up to it, you need to have, you know, uh, you need to have investors overall, but you also need advisors and businesses who are starting to get tuned in. So I think there's a level of education that is becoming more prevalent. What is, I mean, let's just talk about for the basics, what is ESG? Yeah, good question. So ESG or environmental, social, and governance investing, it's not new, even though the numbers would say it is. It actually traces its roots back to the 1600s when members of the Quaker faith refused to buy slave-made products. Mm. Uh, fast forward to the 1980s, and you have the apartheid protests at UC Berkeley, Go Bears. And now we fast forward into today, and we're seeing concerns about climate change. There are many different areas, though, that ESG focuses in on, and uh, all of them are well worthwhile investigating, but climate is the one you frequently hear. Well, and that's certainly the one that someone like a BlackRock is, is starting to say, you know, we're going to get out of coal. And I know that I know that a lot of companies are starting to raise the raise their own internal bars on that um, in terms of kind of that there is a singular definition, which is the acronym mm. ESG, but yeah. in light of the fact that it's still a little bit nebulous and we don't have shared metrics, right, across. True. I think one, one of the things that's very interesting to me is that, you know, you talked about the amount of inflow of capital to ESG investing. 
is it also outperforming? Um, and, and what do we know about that? And is that going to kind of continue the flywheel effect of, of, of better, smarter, more sustainable investing? Well, three answers I'd give you on it. Um, first, it isn't really possible, Lisa, to have a single definition. For example, if investment ABC is focused on water conservation, which in California is a huge issue, I would say that definitely would be a different investment theme uh, than mutual fund DEF that might focus on, let's say, great places to work, yeah. focused on how do you treat your employees. So it's not really possible to compare water conservation with great places to work. They're two different themes. And that can be troubling for investors because they are used to modern portfolio theory. If you say the standard deviation of fund A is this, and the standard deviation of B is this, we can compare. But in ESG, it is focused on many different areas because we have so many different problems to solve in the environmental, the social arena, which looks at the internal workings of a company and its stakeholders. And then G, of course, for governance, really gets into the ethical issues of how a company runs. But as you look at those, and since you mentioned coal, I would wonder if a company with a poor environmental track record that's going bankrupt might be such a good investment, or might it impact your returns? Right. So I think what people need to do really is define what their values are, see how those values are represented inside an investment. Of course, be aware of greenwashing. And as you'll see from academic studies, again, Google is your best friend here. I saw one link that had over 2,000 academic studies showing outperformance of ESG over traditional investments. Yeah. And these are peer-reviewed studies. Now, only a person like me would get excited about 2,000 academic studies, but I love it. I absolutely love it. You don't have to sacrifice your returns for your values. Well, this is, I think, what, you, what you've just said. I mean, first of all, there is a lot of academic and practical corporate study out there that is showing this trade-off is no longer mandatory, right? And, and I think that's the kind of the, the people have always said, the people, you know, on that other side of things have always said, you do. It's a trade-off. Your returns are not going to be the same. Why would you ever do this? I, I mean, including, frankly, you know, some of the advisors I've worked with in the past, you know, when I started asking about this, you know, 10 and 15 years ago, and I've been blown away by the trend lines that have happened, and this impact story, and the lack of trade-offs. So I think we have to accelerate the change that is happening. And I guess I would ask, I mean, you just mentioned, you know, you can Google all of this, you can get some, you know, peer-reviewed data, you can get academic data. There's, an, there, there's sites out there, I mean, even something like a B lab, right? Like has certain kind of justifications and the website at 1% for the planet. I mean, there are lots of organizations. There's also something called fossilfreefunds.org that is out of mm. the Bay area that yeah. I personally love, which is about assigning a letter grade to each of these funds. Um, can you, I know you can't make specific recommendations, but do you know that? And, and can you speak to kind of some of these tools? Yeah, so definitely there are a lot of tools and Google will, be both a help and an hindrance, quite honestly, Lisa. Google provides thousands of results and you might just, analysis paralysis is what happens. Yeah. Now, fossilfreefunds.org, created by the As You So group, um, it goes back to 2014. And they wanted to understand one question and one only. What is the impact of your investment as it relates to climate change? What is the exposure? Again, if I'm investing my money in bankrupt coal companies, I think most people would agree that possibly I'm running the risk of losing money. Yeah. Likewise, uh, if we look at last year during the pandemic where people stopped driving, uh, there were a couple of companies that come to mind that had to um, write off some of their assets because they just weren't profitable. So investing in that might be a cause for concern. And what fossilfreefunds.org seeks to do is analyze an investment and show you the exposure to climate change. In other words, the investment by that fund in fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. They do assign a letter grade, they back it up with data, and then they leave the reader to draw an interpretation. Now, a reader might say, well, no, I disagree, or I'm fine with that. That's a personal decision. But since 2014, what As You So has done is they've expanded the conversation to seven different areas. 
And so as your viewers use this website to look up uh, their mutual funds, they should scroll down two thirds of the way and see seven areas that might be of concern and the full report card. That's, so that's, I like it. That's amazing, actually. To be able to get that kind of detailed information at mm -hmm. our fingertips is phenomenal. I agree with you. It used to be done by hand and I have the scars to show for it. But now, why don't we use technology and really try to start a robust conversation about this topic? And, and as far as the, that robust conversation, I mean, you've been in the, you've been, uh, I, I think, CFPA plus a number of other, you know, acronymic titles that talk to your prowess as a, as a you know, as a certified financial ex. Y and Z um, for over 30 years. I mean, you 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 were at you know Bank of America and T. Rowe Price, and, and now obviously for the last almost 20 years in green retirement. What are these? I mean, we've talked about the trends, but is this global? Is this American? Like, what are the things internationally? Because these problems aren't local; they are global. Mm. Um, what are the? But the the markets are also global, but also the way we invest sometimes tends to be kind of a, a little bit more limited. What are the things that are getting you really excited, and that you're advising people right now uh, in a you know to to move their portfolios towards let's call it impact investing? Yeah, so certainly internationally, the international markets are leading the U.S. Again, you can do the research on it, but you will find in parts of Europe and Asia, they are much further along in the ESG path. Um, there are certain countries that even mandate that pensions divest from coal or from certain kinds of fossil fuels, or they mandate that there be green investments. Uh, here in the United States, it has been quite a, uh, a contentious battle. You can take a look at the last administration. Uh, there was a proposal put out in July, I think, of last year, uh, where ESG was being looked at with some concern. And the final proposal, which came out on October 30th, had received over 8,000 comments, a pushback. I'm heartened by the fact that the international markets are leading the way. Um, the results are what they are, and hopefully people can look at the results and draw the obvious conclusion. And I'm hopeful that the United States will continue moving forward. I, I take it at a very personal level, Lisa. Um, when you go to fossilfreefunds.org, you see the woman in the kayak under blue skies. Uh, currently, the skies outside for us are smoky. Uh, we have yet another fire going in California, drought. Uh, and it's not just California. You can look at um, the hurricanes that are coming through, the snowstorms in Dallas. Yep. Look at the climate refugees that are that are uh, coming about, folks. We've got to do something here. Yeah, no, it's it's, I, and I think I, it leads into a question that I'm curious about, which is, you know, first of all, investors tend to be fickle, but more importantly, consumers, which is more my side of things, are really fickle. How do we, and people's attention spans are limited. I think the younger generations are kind of more tuned in because they've grown up with climate change. They've grown up kind of been more inclusive. So social impact is more on their radar. Climate action is, but they're not yet the ones who are really driving 401k planning, advisory and investment. So how do we keep this from being a fad you know, of the moment? What you just talked about in the prior US administration is hugely troublesome. The global world can keep moving forward, but how do we avoid ESG investing being in any way a fad and becoming more normative? I agree. The way I do it, particularly with my 401k and 403bs, so corporate and nonprofit plans, is I talk with the plan sponsor, the person in charge at the company or the nonprofit, and I focus on performance. The Department of Labor doesn't ask that you have the cheapest fund or the best performing, they simply ask you have a defendable, repeatable process for evaluating investments. I use my process and I present the investments to the committee and say, we might want to look at these. It just so happens that the ESG funds score really well. Again, past performance is no guarantee of future results. I'm not making a recommendation about anything. Yep. But if strictly based on numbers, forget values, Lisa, just on numbers, modern portfolio theory, I have ESG funds that are scoring well, then my committees need to look at them. And that is how we shift the conversation. I don't talk about polar bears or tree hugging or anything. I focus on numbers, exactly as the Department of Labor wants, and certain funds rise to the top. They get incorporated in the plan, 
And of course, you have employees who advocate for funds and a good plan sponsor will listen to his or her employees. Well, and I think that's right. And also, of course, this comes to the conversation that I talk about in my work endlessly, which is about values and values alignment. Yes. Right? I mean, we have our personal values, that story of where this comes from and originates with the Quakers really mm -hmm. warms my heart. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I come from Quaker blood, you know, and, it, ah, and okay. so maybe it makes a little more sense, everything. But um, it, it's pretty fascinating to me when you think about that is a values alignment, a decision not to, you know, invest or purchase slave slave made goods in the 1600s. Um, as much as we come up on, you know, Co Columbus Day. Um, mm -hmm. I think one of the things that we're thinking about now, uh, at least I'm thinking about, is how do individuals, that employee base, mm -hmm. find companies, you know, I talk about this a lot, find companies that align by their own values, but then how do the companies, and what you were just talking about, move to make their own values heard through the investments that they're making across the board, including in their 401k and their retirement, since we're talking about sustainable retirement. You know, the easiest way to approach it, Lisa, I think, is to quote Stephen Covey, begin with the end in mind. Mm -hmm. Take the lineup of investments you have in your retirement plan. They're shown on your statement. And go to something like fossilfreefunds.org and really dig into what are you investing in. You might be surprised. And once you see what you're investing in, and if you're surprised, unfortunately, in a negative way, you might say, well, I don't believe in a, B, C, D, E, and F. That's not who we are. Fine, let's make a change. A 401k advisor should then be able to step up and say, I can help with that. I mean, that's what I do for my clients all across the United States. I would assume any retirement plan advisor will do that. And they will help the company identify values aligned investments that should screen well. Again, screening is important. Department of Labor, defendable, repeatable process. And so I start with the, the end. What do we have? And then I look at, does it represent who I am? And assuming it doesn't, how do I change? That's and this really can be helpful. done at employee and plan sponsor level. Sorry to cut you off there. No, no, please. I, I cut you off. But I, I, I totally appreciate that. I think is, you know, <laughs> I think one of the funny things, we're talking about the future of sustainable retirement. Right. And we yeah. pull the, the name of sustainable into it because that's kind of what we're looking at and what this series with, you know, SVC and ASBC are really yeah. looking to look at is, is a series of things about the future of sustainable X. So this is the first in that series, sustainable retirement. And yet, I mean, it's a little bit of a double entendre because the whole idea of investing for retirement is that it sustains you through retirement. Right. But right. the sustainable and, you know, retirement piece of this is really also about sustainable investing. Um, how do you kind of merge those two things and how do you talk anyone off the ledge who is afraid of the sustainability of their investment piece of the retirement? Well, it's funny when we mention the future, the future is now climate change is real. Again, you can look at the floods that happen in Germany. So rather than say the future of sustainable retirement, I would almost, or sustainable investing, I would want to talk about the here and now. Mm -hmm. If somebody is concerned about it, which is natural. I mean, as humans, we don't like change. First person out of the cave was the one who got stepped on by the woolly mammoth. So make sure you're not first. We look at the existing investments and really dig in and then compare how traditional investments have done against if they had invested in a more sustainable manner. And I think the numbers will speak to them. Yeah. And uh, there are people who will uh, get it based on the numbers. There will be people who need more education. I've had people say to me, well, I really like passive investing, low cost, low fee investing. Believe it or not, those options exist in sustainable investing too. So whether you're a passive investor or an active investor, I think there's room at the table. The biggest thing we have to do is take a seat at the table. We can't talk about it in the future. Sadly, with California burning, it's now. I, I think that's a really important call to action. Um, as we wrap up, Timothy, um, I, I've, you know, again, a lot of these topics that I ask experts about are not my area of expertise, what might I have missed that you'd like to leave listeners and viewers with uh, around the topic of the here and now of, of sustainable retirement and sustainable investing? <laughs> well, somebody said to me that people spend more time planning for vacation than they do thinking about their retirement. And I, I know this isn't a fun topic. 
It's not the most exciting. It's one that I enjoy. There are a small group out there that focus on it, and I would encourage your listeners to please talk to their retirement plan advisor and to their employer about the investments in the plan. This is a $12 trillion industry. Imagine, Lisa, if we shifted even 10% of that into sustainable investments, the change we could make. But it's got to start at both the top and the bottom, and we need the change. If anyone doesn't believe it, well, just take a look outside at the weather and uh, I think they'll get it. Uh, Timothy, you summed it up brilliantly. I always believe that action happens when it comes top down and bottom up and meet in the middle. So I appreciate that. Uh, and the time is now. We, we, we certainly agree on that. So thank you for sharing your wisdom, your passion, and your expertise on Future of XYZ today. Thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. You take care. Thank you. And for everyone listening, uh, this has been a special episode in conjunction with Social Venture Network, SVC. Check them out. The work they do is incredible, as is their partner organization, American Sustainable Business Council, uh, really looking at how we drive sustainability and impact uh, throughout the business community in the America and obviously in partnership with the world. Um, and if you haven't already subscribed to Future of XYZ, please do so. You can do so on YouTube as well as Spotify, Apple, uh, Amazon, and other podcast platforms. And you can follow us at Future of XYZ on Instagram. We look forward to seeing you next week. Timothy Yi, Future of Sustainable Retirement. Thank you again. Pleasure. Take care.